All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is still the 5th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2023. Continuing on with this series, because one video would be way too long, on the New Covenant, especially the New Covenant in the New Testament here, which is called the New Testament, but it means New Covenant. A testament is a covenant that's brought into force by the death of the testator. Yeah, you know, the death of Christ. That's that's a difference in itself. The Old Testament, you had the, the death of an animal. In the New Testament, you have the death of the Lamb of God, the Son of God himself, who spills his blood. It's the blood. His blood is the blood of the new covenant, the eternal covenant, covenant the perfect covenant of God, the final answer for the fall of mankind in the garden, bringing man to the ultimate purpose of God, to be his very image. And we haven't seen that totally fulfilled yet. We're waiting until the the message of the gospel goes out into all the nations, and then the end shall come. Then Christ shall rule for 1,000 years on earth, and then once he's put all enemies under his feet, then uh, he will deliver up the kingdom to the Father. And then we have the new creation, the new heavens, and the new earth. Where God the Father, God in his totality, dwells in our midst and in us in the new Jerusalem. The church being the, the, uh, the center of the universe. The church as in God's people. And there are nations besides that, too, that come into that. So it's, it's not a, a Augustinian uh, floating around in clouds, strumming harps for eternity. Or a Roman Catholic standing in a great congregation staring at God. Well, God has all kinds of things in mind. And we're in the center of it all. As the, as the brethren of Christ, the firstborn of many brethren, we are the people of God. It just does not yet appear what we shall then be. <laughs> we are currently incognito, dressed in robes of flesh, clay, vessels of clay. Yep, until he returns, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I can get excited thinking about that. I was just looking at some of the events on the news and it's like, no. <laughs> well, not on the, the mainstream news. I don't watch that. It's all a pack of lies. Yeah, it's all driven by money. Uh, if, it's, if it's the love of mammon, you cannot serve God and mammon. Every Christian better take that. To every young person, every young Christian, you cannot serve God and mammon. If you want to have uh, the wealth and the pleasures of this world, just forget Christ. Just forget him. If that's your God, to follow after the things of this world, don't even bother trying to follow Christ. You can't do it. Your heart needs to be transformed. You need to be born again. Be freed from your idols. All right, so we're going we're to look at, I, I can only look at a little bit of the New Testament because it's so full of it. Oh, I see it's coming back. Oh, yeah, I wiped the, I wiped the, the covering off my face there. That is sort of a, a bright, a purple. Don't worry about it. It's not a problem. It did smart a bit when it happened, but it's just cosmetic. And I found my glasses. God knew where they were. Apparently they got knocked off my face, and in the I was a bit stunned and in pain. I didn't notice. 
too occupied with other things. I thought I'd just maybe set them down someplace while I was doing something else and couldn't find them. I don't know. All of the pleasures of being old. Uh, actually, there are some benefits to being old, too. My mind is not as sharp and quick as it once was, but my, but my understanding has increased dramatically. Dramatically. My ability to understand Scripture and to know God keeps growing. That doesn't wear down as you get old because it's not of the flesh. The Spirit of God is in you, and he renews you, and he gives life to our mortal bodies, and he even helps us find our glasses. Just ask, and you shall receive. <laughs> yeah, once I did. I know so many times, so many times this has happened to me. I don't mean, I, well, I've lost my glasses too many times too, but but been in a situation where I couldn't fix it. And just, God, help me. Please. Yep, he answers. He answers. Might take a minute or two, but he, but he answers. And it brought to mind, you know, I'd already looked. I'd already looked where I got smacked in the face. But when I went out there and I pulled the bags of chick, chicken feed back, from where I'd put them, there were my glasses on the floor, folded up. Already looked. But it was once I asked God, knowing he full well, he knows where they are. Please help. And he does. He does. Even the small things like that, he cares about. He cares. Just ask. Ask in faith. If you don't ask in faith, then don't expect. But so many Christians don't believe that God actually does things like that. How can you be a Christian? Where is your faith? You have faith for some things, like Jesus said, Oh, ye of little faith. They, the disciples had faith for some things, but not for God getting them across a stormy lake. It's, they thought they, they're they fishermen, professional fishermen. and oh, well, this is So they, they, they were relying on their own experience. Jesus was asleep in the bow. Like <laughs> disciples, what is wrong with this guy? We're Lord, don't you care? We're perishing. Oh, ye of little faith. No problem. Seas calm, wind stopped. And the disciples are gaping at him in awe. They're like, what manner of man is this? Well, the God man, the Messiah, the one who created all things. All right, so let's go to the scripture and look. I'm going to just pull up a, a couple because I'm trying to keep things a little short. And I don't know, we're going to end up in Hebrews, but I want to show you some samples in other places first. First, we'll go back to the Old Testament, to uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. And again, having to do with dispensationalism, uh, chopping the Bible up, not understanding the church, not understanding that it's God's one people of God, Old Testament and New, in the Old Testament under a different covenant, that none of the Old Testament saints uh, could come into the presence of God until Christ atoned for their sin at the cross. And then, and that's why Abraham, Jesus spoke of Abraham being in paradise, or called the bosom of Abraham, awaiting and that's why Abraham was glad to see my day. They were waiting for Christ to come, to make atonement, the Lamb of God, to usher in the new covenant. And once that was in, then Christ took captivity captive into heaven, took him with him when he ascended. And now, now a heaven's been opened by, by Christ. You don't have to go to a holding tank uh, to wait for that. Catholics. You don't have to go to purgatory. Christ has fully atoned for your sins. Don't think you have to pay for it. That's an abomination. That's, that's refusing to believe in Christ and what he did for you. If, if his cross isn't sufficient, nothing will be sufficient. How can you add to what he has done? 
Please believe in Christ. Christ alone. Look at your Pope. Do you want to follow that wretched individual, that apostate, that idol worshiper? Follow Christ. He is the only one worthy to follow. The only one truly worthy to follow. Quotation from Exodus, verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 6, or thereabouts. Let me go back a little bit to see if there's anything else. Ah, yes, let's go back. Verse 5. Now, here's a difference you'll see. See, the old covenant was conditional on obedience. The new covenant is unconditional. You don't have to fulfill conditions other than trusting God. Conditioned only on faith, not on work, not on obedience to law. Now, that's what and we see in the Old Testament right here, we see the difference in covenants. But the promises are the same. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. God is not the God only of the Jews. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Do, do those words sound familiar to you at all? Is there something that sounds like that in the New Testament? Yes, there is indeed. 1 Peter chapter 2. Starting, well, I'm going to go up a little bit. Let's see, where should I start? Oh, they're just, I have to, I have to go way back. <laughs> okay, first was chapter 2 of Peter, okay? Because this is so full of good things, of new covenant, that I can't just go to the focus of it right here. But we'll get there, we'll get there. So please bear with the word of God, please. If you'd like to stand, that would be appropriate. Uh Churches that do that, that's not necessarily a bad thing, except there's some people, there are days when it is painful to stand up, depending on what you've been doing. Therefore, some people, some people just, uh, you know, very difficult. Be merciful. <laughs> love the brethren, love the brethren. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. So we can just lay it aside. We don't have to work at it. Just lay it aside. As newborn babes, the new birth, you must be born again, born from above, born of the Spirit. Desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So in other words, if you, if you have been a recipient of God's grace, if you've been born again, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious, he is the chief cornerstone, the, the, the beginning of the whole structure of God's house, his true temple that is being built up of living stones like you, if you're born again. You also, again, I'm getting ahead of myself, as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house. I could have just read that. A holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What kind of spiritual sacrifices? Praise, honor, worship. They're not really sacrifices in the sense it costs us anything. We're not sacrificing. We're just thanking God for his sacrifices. Like the, the elders casting down their crowns, crowns before the Lamb. What is that saying? Hey, you're really the one that did all this. I don't deserve this. This is all your crown, O oh Lord. The elders in the book of Revelation. Casting down their crowns before the Lord, before the Lamb. Why? Because they're his workmanship. They can't take credit for their works, but they did. It's all from him. And he deserves all the honor and glory 
and praise forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, it is also contained in scriptures, Behold, I, I lay in Zion, talking Old Testament scriptures, a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Old Testament promise of Christ and salvation by faith. Grace through faith. No one in the scripture is ever saved any, by any other means. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone is in the same boat. All are sinners. Christ died for the sins of the whole world. But in order to be partakers of that atonement, you must be in him by faith. You must trust in him. Without faith, if you don't believe it, if you don't trust in him, uh, you are calling God a liar. The true sin unto death, the true sin that uh, is unforgivable, is a continuing and final rejection of the Holy Spirit's work in calling you to Christ. Apart from the Holy, Holy Spirit's work drawing you to Christ, you're not going to be saved because your inclination is to run away. He has to work in you. He has to bring you to the point and to the knowledge of your sin. And then at some point, it's up to you. Are you going to trust, are you going to believe the testimony of God himself and of Christ and of the apostles? Once he's revealed the truth to you of your sin and the gospel, work of the Holy Spirit, are you going to receive that? And be born again by by believing that. Or are you going to, I don't want that. I'm not interested in the Son of God dying for my sins. That I might have f eternal life rather than eternal damnation as a free gift from God. I'm not interested. That's what you're saying. I've got more important things to do. And what do you think God thinks about that? His wrath abides on those who refuse to believe. To have God's wrath abide on you eternally? That is hell. Hell is not a place where you can escape from God. There is no escape anywhere from God. Best to be his friend. Better still to be his child. As a free gift. Eternal life is a free gift. No purgatory, no works, no nada. Just trust him. As I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Pretty bad to reject, you know, Make yourself an enemy of the prince and suddenly find the prince is now the king. Bad situation. Psalm 2. Kiss the sun. Kiss the sun. Be wise. Kiss the sun. Because he's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. He's coming as that. Not as a child born in a manger. He's coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords with all power and glory. And yet the kings of this earth and their armies will seek to oppose his coronation procession. Bad choice. Really bad choice. 
But a very short-lived choice. <laughs> Literally. This this sword, the the now a sword comes out of his mouth. Well, his word. His word is the sword. And uh, that's it. He pronounces judgment on those who oppose him. And they die where they stand. Consumed by the word of God. Bad choice. And all the church is going to say, Amen! Because they deserve it. Thoroughly. Thoroughly deserve it. And that's a lot of what happens in the book of Revelation and is happening now is preparation for this judgment when it will be evident to all creatures that God is entirely just and they deserve exactly what they get. Best to trust in his grace and his salvation rather than in yourself. Forgive me for getting preachy. I can't help myself. But therefore, to you who believe he's precious, but to those who are disobedient, uh, disobedient, a stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Quotes from the Old Testament, of course. They stumble, being disobedient to the word. Who is the word? Not what is the word. Who is the word? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The scripture, when it says the word of God, almost always is referring to Christ, to the divine word of God, not to the scriptures. That mistake is often made, but it's to a person. Like in the Old Testament, and the word of God came to the prophet saying, who is the word of God? It doesn't say the Bible came to the prophet saying, who came to the, uh, the prophet saying? The word of God came, he did. The one who became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is God. God revealing himself. God speaking. God creating. That's the word of God. God saving. They stumbled being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. Appointed why? Because of lack of faith. Uh, belief. Those who disbelieve, they are appointed to this, to that end. It's not people that haven't disbelieved that are point, appointed to that end. It's those who hear and disbelieve. As opposed to the Calvinist idea that God created, chose to create a people to destroy for his own glory. That That is an abomination, That those doctrines, which are so strongly present in the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Reformed Baptist Confession of Faith, which is basically the Westminster Confession of Faith with believers' baptism at it. <sighs> which could explain why the Reformed Baptists are doing so poorly. They've had so many scandals and everything else, too. They are not biblical. They're not focused on Christ. They're focused on their theology way too much. That's not good. And James White calls himself a Reformed Baptist, by the way. Do you know who I'm talking about? If you don't, don't worry about it. Don't go looking for him, okay? He's not someone you should be following. He's been going downhill in the wrong direction. There's so many people out there, hot shots, and uh, people with, with a good big following or something, they end up going downhill. Then they try to make comebacks. Ugh. From what I hear from uh, brother uh, Chris Roseborough, good Lutheran brother. Uh, I would like to ask him some questions. We have actually communicated once in a while. Was it on Twitter? I think. I know he's into photography, too, sometimes. We have to keep our sanity. So we, we go out. I think he does the same thing as I do. We go out to God's creation and try to capture the beauty of God's creation. You can't really do it. 
I mean, no photograph you take is ever as beautiful as God's creation. And God's creation is not even close to God's beauty. So, But it's a lot better than looking at the movies or something, which is a bunch of lies. Uh, their purpose is not to glorify God. God's creation is, his, its purpose is to glorify God. To glorify God, that means to be revealing, God revealing himself. That's his true glory. And that's why Christ is the true glory of God. Because he is the perfect revelation of God. Perfect revelation. Because he is God. You can't be the perfect revelation of God without being God. That is why God must be in us, his church, as the revelation of God. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we will be like Christ, perfectly like him when he returns. He will make us, transform us by his power. The same power that spoke the universe into existence. Let there be, and it was so. But if you remember, God got his hands dirty, making Adam, formed him out of the dust of the earth, and then breathed life into him. Mouth to mouth, like. You could, you could picture it that way. Breathed his spirit into Adam breathed life into him. And Adam became a living soul. But Christ, the second Adam, has become a life-giving spirit. Much more. Uh, it's like a two-stage creation, almost. First Adam, first the flesh, and then the spiritual, the new birth. The, the natural birth, and then the new birth. The natural creation, and then the, the spiritual creation. The real thing that lasts forever as opposed to a temporary thing that is wearing out. Which the, the Old Testament even talks about, the prophets that, that, that talks about God will change creation like one changes an old garment, puts on a new garment. Things are about to change. Because that happens after the Millennium Kingdom, after we've ruled and reigned with Christ for a thousand years over the world. That's when you have real theonomy, God ruling. Not so matter much a matter of law, though, but ruling in person in Christ and his people. Not a matter of a law. It's a matter of... Uh, see, that America, we can't think in these terms because we're all about law, governor, a government of law. Well, in the kingdom of Christ, it isn't a government of law. It's a government of a person like a king, the king of kings and the lord of lords, personally rules. And Christians, in perfect harmony with him, will rule with him. Personally ruling in Christ's name, as he is in us and we are in him. And he is in the Father and the Father is, is, is in him. It's so the king that's true that's the kingdom of God. It's not a matter of laws and rules and regulations and doctrines. It's a matter of personal relationship. The closest possible personal relationship. Completely different. Just like the old covenant and new covenant are completely different. One is law and what we do. The new one is God and what he does. different kind of covenant back to peter here but they were they stumbled being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed uh, disobedient because of unbelief that that's they were appointed to that end because of unbelief but you are a chosen generation what do we just read back in uh, uh, exodus chapter 19 verse 6 you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Actually, this is from multiple sources that Peter's quoting here. He's applying it to who? These were all promises to Israel. Who is he talking to? The church. The church is Israel. It is believing Israel. It is a continuation of believing Israel under a new covenant. Whether you're Jewish or Greek or, or, or Gentile, if you're in the church, you're neither. You're one new man. Christ has brought the two together and made them one 
new man in him. You're not Jewish. You're not Gentile anymore. You're his, the people of God. A chosen generation, a, a race. The word generation and the word race is the same. means the same thing. It's not a period of time, by the way. It can mean that, but it, 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 that's not the real meaning of it. It's commonly misapplied and misunderstood. A royal priesthood. See, that's, see, that's different. The priesthood, the priesthood of Aaron was not a royal priesthood. Aaron was not of the tribe of Judah. He's of the, the, the tribe of uh, Levites. The Levites, the tribe of Levi, is where the priesthood is in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's a royal priesthood of Jesus, the son of David, which had no priestly purpose in the Old Testament. If the king decided to offer a sacrifice in the Old Testament, he was in big trouble. But Jesus, in Jesus the king is the sacrifice. This is pretty good. This is coming off the top of my head. Don't, it's not my doing, okay? I, I've discovered this often when I'm trying to teach. I get double blessings myself. It's like, wow. I learn as I listen to myself, <sighs> which, is, which is a bit strange. His, a royal uh, priesthood, a holy nation. These were promises to, to the Israel in the Old Testament. Did they achieve that? Did they obtain these things? No. No, only in Christ are these things obtained. He, it is a continuation. The promises get carried over and fulfilled in the Israel of God under the new covenant in Christ. His own special people. Didn't we read that in Exodus 19? A special people for me. He says these things in other places too in the Old Testament and the law. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness. This is particularly about Gentiles too. Because we were called out of complete darkness. Our ancestors were the pagans. Most of us. My ancestors were pagans. Pagan pagans. Worshipping Thor and Odin. Pirates. Vikings. By the way, uh, to go a Viccan was a summer exercise. That was your summer vacation to go raid other people's countries and take them slaves and kill them and steal their loot. Or you just go trading with your boats too. <sighs> Called us out of darkness. Truly, indeed. For his praise. See, we can, and personally, every one of us was not born in the kingdom of God. You have to be born into that after you're naturally born. We were called out of our darkness personally. Sometimes deep darkness. Sometimes some of us had a certain knowledge of the truth, but yet we were walking in utter darkness like the prodigal son. I think that could be said of all Christians. <laughs> especially those raised in Christian homes, or at least homes that had a, you know, where you're exposed to some knowledge of, of the cross and Christ, even if it wasn't necessarily the best knowledge. But uh, you weren't walking in light of what you had. You were walking in darkness and pursuing your own desires. You were following after the flesh because that's all you were until you were born again. Who were once not a people. 
not a nation, not an ethnos, but now are the people of God. See, see, this isn't just, this isn't simply Israel. This is all people, all those God has called from out of every nation, tribe, and tongue, including Israel, to be his one people. Not just Israel. The fall goes back to Adam. All are descendants of Adam. God's salvation is open to all the descendants of Adam. Am I actually going to get to what I wanted to get to? I think this is pretty good. If I don't, we'll just do another video. Called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Who, which, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. We call each other brothers, sisters. Right. Why? Because we are. We are. Christ himself is our fellowship. He is our koinonia. He is our common possession. He is our unity, and he is our king and our Lord, and our Savior, and our God. Who had not obtained mercy. The Jews didn't obtain mercy, and certainly the Gentiles didn't. But now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, what we are in this world today, we are not citizens of this world. We are sojourners and pilgrims. We are just traveling through this land of woe. There's a, a, a spiritual that goes that way. I can't remember how it goes. Oh, well, I sort of like that song. It's not utterly biblical, but yeah, we are so sojourners and pilgrims. This is not our home. The United States of America is not the kingdom of God. Have you noticed? We know whose kingdom it is. It is not God's kingdom. We know who's on the throne in Washington. It is not Jesus Christ. It will be if he leaves that city intact. Yeah, he might just wipe it off the map. Build on a swamp anyway, literally. All those mon all those idols to men, all those idols to to dead men. No idols to Christ, though. Christ doesn't need idols. None of them can represent him. No image can represent Christ. Only Christ can represent Christ and his people when we walk in him. We will be his image, perfectly his image. So wherever we are in the world, ruling and reigning uh, under Christ, we will be the exact image of Christ. So be just like him in perfect harmony with him, filled with him. That'll be the day. Yes. It's not exercising our will, because our will, not really, our will will be identical with God's will, so. Perfect harmony. Perfect harmony with God. Ruling in righteousness. As God's image in Christ, in us. <sighs> I'm beginning to feel pretty good today. Then they didn't start out very good, but... Abstain from fleshly lusts that wage war against the soul and have your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. This has to do with the video I did the other day. Uh, well, the video is about God's word and, you know, the problems of uh, saving fundamentalism. The fact that we so often don't walk as sojourners and pilgrims and we uh, don't keep our conduct honorable among the Gentiles and we are, are often not being the image of God. We are being mani uh, uh, shining manifestations of the flesh because we don't love the brethren. Jesus said, By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you love one another. 
So doesn't that mean that's one of the major tools of evangelism, brothers and sisters? Not polemics, not fighting, not protesting against sin. <laughs> what a wasted exercise that is. I don't like sin, and I don't like sinners. Oh, that's going to solve the problem. Not law. <laughs> that never pro solves a problem of sin. Oh, we need to get new laws passed. Really? How come the old laws didn't work? No. <laughs> no. You, ne you need the new covenant. You need to be transformed inside wash the inside of the cup then the outside will be clean also unlike the pharisees that just washed the exterior made themselves look holy on the outside but inside they were full of all manner of rotten flesh corruption they weren't born again They weren't of the new covenant. They weren't even of the old covenant, really, because they w lived in hypocrisy, pretending to be what they weren't, which was holy. <sighs> that, in they, uh, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, when they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. His visitation. When God comes to visit, that means God's coming to judge. Yep, the day of judgment. Yeah, they'll see what God has actually done in us, and they will glorify God. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And then he goes. He goes on from there, telling us how to how to uh, live as Christians, how we ought to live as Christians, to the glory of God, and uh, what we're called to be. But I don't want to. That's too far off the point right now. So let's uh, let's go over to to Hebrews. So first of all, let's go here. Should I bring this over? No. There are. Four cases in the New Testament where the uh, Jesus saying where explicitly uses the word new covenant in regard to the Last Supper. Uh, all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, record him saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. And Paul does the same thing in First Corinthians chapter eleven, that which he received uh, also. So he quotes, This is the new covenant in my blood. I am shocked that I've heard almost no sermons about the New Covenant. As a little bit of a by, sideways there, here, uh, there is, you know, covenant theology and Reformed covenant theology, and which was really a very small thing, but they're very noisy. There are very few Calvinists in this world, very few Reformed people in this world. Reformed Baptists are smaller than almost any sect. There is a handful of those. But they're very noisy. And then, of course, dispensationalism is so broad spread in the United States, not elsewhere, but in the United States, that it seems like that's all there is. Dispensationalism and Reformed Covenant theology is not true. There's you know, Lutheran theology. Uh, Lutherans just are, aren't noisy. Normally, they just aren't. They're they are different. They're like their view of the Old Testament is completely different than a, a Calvinist view of the Old Testament. Luther was absolutely correct. The Old Testament, the all the Bible is supposed to be read Christocentrically. Christ is the center. It's all about Christ from the beginning to the end. It's all about Christ. And if you don't read it with that in in view, you're going to misinterpret God's word. You're going to misuse God's word. That's the purpose is the revelation of Christ. So you have to interpret it in that way. And Luther said that. He is correct. He was correct. Not wrong about everything. By no means. He just 
was halfway, had a halfway reformation. He was right in the most important thing. He just left us with a sort of a mess to clean up. Unfortunately, they haven't cleaned it up. They haven't cleaned up Luther's mess. Um, Come to think of it, I don't know if you should clean up Luther's mess. <laughs> I think the mess, like God leaving us in vessels of clay, maybe Luther's mess is a good thing because it helps us stay focused on the truth Luther spoke, which is about salvation being by grace through faith in Christ and that alone, uh, and ignoring the, the mess he left behind that basically came from Roman Catholicism. He was focused on what was important. You can only do so much in a few years, you know. He did stay pretty much focused on that. And when he got off of that, bad things happened. But that happens to just about all of us now and then. We get sidetracked, go down a bypath. <sighs> it looks good. It's important. Get into stupid things like culture wars. Which, of which no good comes. So here we have uh, in, uh, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians 3, 6. And what I did here, I just searched on the, uh, let's see, I can, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to mess up my settings. Or it was, on the right hand, uh, left hand side of the screen, I've got a list of references that pulled up when I did search. That's all it is. And for New Covenant, in the New Testament, the, the term is used nine times. Second Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 6 says this, which is interesting. You are our, our epistle, our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. In other words, those who had come to faith through the testimony of Paul— church in Corinth, of all things, the church in Corinth, is a letter to the world. The testimony of God's salvation, God has saved, saved all these sinners. That is a testimony, that we are the testimony of the grace of God. That God saved wretches like us, like me. Read by all men. See, obviously, he's not speaking literally here. He's speaking that as a metaphor, we are metaphorically like letters, and our lives are seen by people, and therefore we're like an epistle written to them that are read by all men. They see our lives. They see they see our faith in Christ. They see our love for Christ. I hope. That's what they're supposed to be saying. If God can do this with the Corinthians, he can do it with you and me. What a messed up church. Let, yet Paul writes this. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, served by us. Uh, diakona, to, a deacon is a servant. Uh, ministered by us. In other words, that Paul's ministry had uh, ended up with them being epistles of Christ being written. Written not by ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. New Covenant. The promise of the Holy Spirit uh, is the New Covenant. The Holy Spirit being in you. Jesus Christ said to his disciples that the Holy Spirit has been with you but he shall be in you. That's why Ezekiel 36 is a promise of the new covenant. That did not exist in the Old Testament. Until atonement was made, there is no way the Holy Spirit could dwell in us, in sinful human beings, unatoned for. No way. God could not get that close to us without us being consumed. He's holy. We're not. How do you deal with that? How can unholy people be reconciled to the holy God? 
Christ, the cross. Who provided that solution? God. Why? Because he loves people. He loves sinners. He wants them to be saved. Calvinism doesn't believe that. I mean, confessional Calvinism, Westminster Confession of Faith, does not believe that. Including Reformed Baptists, they don't believe that. Only some people were created by God for that purpose. Everybody else was created to be destroyed in hell for the glory of God. That's what they say. That's not what the Bible says. For God so loved the world, his creation. Did God hate Adam? No. He had a plan back in the garden, remember? He had a plan. Salvation, the promise of a Savior, goes back to the Garden of Eden. They didn't need a Savior until they fell. If God wanted to destroy sinners, he would have destroyed them. Solved the whole problem right there. Nope. Didn't do that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Loved the fallen world. His marred creation, marred by sin, by rebellion. God, the absolute ruler of all things, rather than simply destroy and create again, he said, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to arrange things so I can show grace and mercy and love to people who are sentenced to death by my law and reveal those characteristics of mine through that. Reveal my, my, my nature more thoroughly through the salvation of these lost souls. Written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, Law of Moses, but on tablets of flesh. That is of the heart. What did we see back in Jeremiah and Ezekiel? That God was going to write his commandments on our hearts. Give us a new heart. Take out the heart of stone. These are all promises of the new covenant revealed in the Old Testament. That's why the disciples did not ask Jesus at the Last Supper, what do you mean by a new covenant? They knew these things. The Jews knew of these promises. They were waiting for this to happen. Just like we're waiting for the return of Christ and the and the, the final fulfillment of the promises of the new covenant, the redemption of our body, and us being conformed fully to the, to the image of Christ. Truly his temple, truly his people, truly glorifying him as everyone else sees God's grace and mercy in us. That we are in a special way the people of God. In the midst of the nations. As it shall be, especially during the millennium. We will be constantly bearing witness by our very existence. God's grace and mercy to sinners. And a testimony to them that this is the kind of God we worship. A God who loves sinners, who seeks to save sinners, restore them, and make them what they were supposed to be from creation. And we have such trust through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Yes. Yes. And we start thinking, we can do it. The answer to that is, no, you can't. And I can say for 47 years, I can witness to that fact. Yes, when I trust in myself, it's a waste of time. When I trust in Christ and 
let him do things his way and just say, Lord, I'm yours. Use me if you want. Don't use me if you don't want. It's up to you. Then things happen. Trust in him, both to work in us, both to will and to do his good pleasure. You don't have to go seeking God's will. Just trust him. You don't have to know what his will is in particular. Just trust him. He knows what his will is. Uh, if you if he told you what you were supposed to do, you'd pull a Jonah. <laughs> Go run and hide someplace. Because you'd realize, I can't do that. You don't have to do it. It's God that does it. You're just a vessel. He, is ha well, he has to fill you. It's a filling that counts. What's in the cup is what's important, not the cup itself. The cup serves to, to hold the, the, the important thing, what's in the cup. So what's important in us is the Spirit of God. We're just the vessel. When, you, when the vessel starts thinking it's important, something is not going to work right. Verse 6. Who also made us sufficient as ministers, servants, of what? The new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Obedience to law kills. The letters, the, the ministry of death. But if the ministry of death, what letters in particular? The ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious. See, the law has a ministry of death. The curse of the law is death. There's no life in the law. The, life, the law condemns sinners. There is no life for sinners in the law. There is no blessing in the law for sinners, only for those who keep the covenant perfectly. Then they receive the blessings of the law. Who received the blessings of the law? Christ, because he kept the law perfectly. And in Christ, we have the blessings of the law also, because he kept the law and we're in him. Our lives are hidden in him. We died with him. We rose with him. The church is Christ. Christ is the church. We are all made one. We are made one spirit with him. I mean, what the New Testament teaches is so far beyond what we think it teaches. Ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, the Ten Commandments, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, fading away, how will the ministry of the Spirit be not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the law, the law condemns, the ministry of righteousness has far more glory. Righteousness what? We're made righteous. We're impute. We have the righteousness given to us of Christ, and God is also at work in us to conform us to that image over a period of time. That is, until he comes, and then we'll be instantly transformed into the image of Christ. All right, so here we clearly have the promises of the new covenant. Speaking of the new covenant, of the spirit, of a better ministry, uh, not not the uh, the covenant of the law, which had glory but condemns, but the covenant of grace, the covenant of righteousness, a gift of righteousness, a covenant of life that's more glorious. That's what we have. The new covenant is much better than the old covenant. So now let's go quickly to Hebrews. I'm already at one hour. But finding fault with them, verse uh, chapter 8, verse 8. Let's go up a little bit. Uh, Hebrews is Hebrews assumes a knowledge of the law. 
which is why it's hard to understand. It assumes a good knowledge of the law. And it's because it's written to Jews, to Jewish believers, to encourage them not to turn back. They were under persecution. They were under tribulation, pressure, which is what the word tribulation means, pressure, to go back to the law of Moses, to, to get rid of this Christ thing and go back to the law of Moses. And the, the writer of Hebrews is encouraging them not to and telling them, if you do that, there's nothing there for you. There's no life there. To go back to that is to die. Because the law can't make you good. The law can't make you righteous. The law can't, make, can't reconcile you to God. So he's talking about the superiority of the new covenant. For every, and if you don't, Hebrews, there's things in it that can be misunderstood readily by people today. For every priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, capital, Christ, that is, also has something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. In other words, the temple was still standing when this epistle was written. There were still priests of Levi who were offering sacrifices and gifts in the stone temple. Who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, that is, God said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. See, the earthly tabernacle and then the temple were merely a, uh, a physical likeness of things that, were, that are in heaven. In the book of Revelation, we find a temple in heaven. Actually, in several places, I think. Th that these are a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. But now... He has obtained a more excellent ministry, Christ has, in, uh, than the earthly priests, inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant. The previous co covenant was mediated through angels and Moses. This is the, Christ is the mediator, is, this, is God himself, and the Son of God and the Son of Man, and he is the mediator of a better covenant that he purchased with his own blood, not with the blood of animals. But I'm probably getting ahead of myself here. Which was established on better promises. We've already seen the better promises. Promises of the new covenant enumerated in the Old Testament. For if the first covenant was faultless, then there would be no uh, then no place would have been sought for a second. It was it was it was it was faulty. Why was the first covenant faulty? Because it didn't solve the problem of sin. It just condemned sinners. It did not make you righteous. It did not reconcile you to God. It, did, it wasn't an answer for sin. It was a re, uh, it, purpose was to reveal sin, not to cure it. Because finding fault with them, he says, God, quote from the Old Testament, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Back to Jeremiah 31, 31. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. So in the future, from Jeremiah's day, I will... okay Says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. 
not on tablets of stone. Internally, as Paul said, not without law, but under the law of Christ. Christ himself ruling us personally. Not mediated by mere language, but which can't accurately portray God's will anyway. It is Christ himself in person ruling and reigning over us. So if you don't confess Christ as your Lord, you're pretty much toast. That doesn't mean you always obey him. It means that you recognize his authority over you and in you. Or you need to be born again. We still are in vessels of flesh. We fail all the time. But we're not what we used to be. We still have this, this lingering corruption, this smell of death on us. Uh, but uh, you like some dirty old clothes that have been in the wrong place too long. But we're going to change those pretty soon. Put some new clothes on. A new body on. And I, I'll write, uh, I'll, I'll put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. See, in the Old Testament, if you've gone over to, to Israel at the Wailing Wall, you've seen this. You've seen the, uh, the Jewish uh, men worshiping with the phylacteries, the box, leather box in their forehead, which contains quotations from the law. And on their right hand, you see a box, and it's wrapped around, and that contains quotations from the law, too. Because the scripture said, you shall bind my laws on your forehead and on your hand, your arm. Same thing. Uh, they took it literally. What did God mean? He meant this, exactly what happens in the New Covenant. He puts his laws in our mind, his will his righteousness, his justice, in our mind and writes them on our hearts. So we understand them and we desire them. We love them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Promises, better promises. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, Know the Lord for they shall all know me. This is a promise of the new covenant. If you've been born again, you're a partaker of the new covenant, and you know God. You know the Lord. Yahweh. You know Yahweh. L-O-R-D caps. That's Yahweh. From the least of them, from the little child that believes Christ, to the greatest of them. You don't have to ask somebody to teach you. You know God. You don't have to be taught God. You know him. Now, your understanding, your knowledge, yeah, you can teach some of that. But the, the personal knowing some of the relationship, you can't teach somebody that. You can teach somebody about a person, but you can't. The relationship is between persons. You have to have the person of God. You have to know him. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, or injustice, the same word, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Why? Because Christ paid them in full. The debt is canceled. What's a debt? The wages of sin is death. Paid in full. His vicarious death. And how many do not believe in that? Well, they have no salvation. They are unsaved people. doesn't matter if they're the bishop of Canterbury or a professor in some seminary. If they reject Christ's substitutionary atonement, Christ rejects them. By grace through faith we are saved. Those who have no faith in what Christ has done are not saved. They don't have saving faith. In that he says, quote, a new covenant, unquote. He made the first obsolete. In other words, there's a better one. The old, the old one's obsolete. You know, like this world. We come out with a, a brand new machine or a brand new uh, vehicle that, that is so much of an improvement 
those old ones, they, they're of no value anymore. They're, they're, they've been obsolete. They're obsolescent. They're obsolete because something so much better has come about. The, the old has, has no utility anymore. And the old could never deliver you from sins. The old only temporarily covered things. It could not change your heart. The new covenant does. The promise of God is to change your heart. The promise of God is you will know him. You will be his child. He will dwell in you. Law could never do any of that. He has made the first, the covenant of Moses, obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. In a few years, the temple was going to vanish away. had no purpose anymore. The temple of God in Jerusalem was obsolete because something far better had come. And the temple no longer served any purpose. So God removed it. Removed the temptation to continue with an empty, vain system of worship, which couldn't accomplish the will of God anyway was just temporary. The law of God was temporary until the eternal covenant was brought in by Christ. So here, you know, we can go keep going through here, but I've already uh, been talking long enough. So here we see in the New Testament the promises of the, old co of the new covenant that was given in the old. And dispensationalists often, which are so common in the United States, among Bible-believing Christians. The dispensationalist idea is that, that the Old Covenant is only for the Jews. The promises of the New Covenant in the Old Testament were for the Jews. Well, they were for believing Jews when Christ comes. The church is made up of believing Jews and believing Gentiles. It started with only believing Jews. It came first to the Jews, and then it went to the Samaritans, sort of halfway Jews, and then it was brought to the Gentiles. And the apostles were like, what's God doing? Those are Gentiles. Well, the whole deal with Peter. God had to give him a vision three times to convince Peter that, to go to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, a Roman centurion, a country that was occupying Judea and Samaria and Galilee, a pagan country. And though Cornelius was a devout man, what the Jews would call a God-fearer, and had done many good things and given gifts and charity to, to Jewish people, in other words, he was a, a good man, but yet he was not saved. And so what did God do? He sent Paul, uh, uh, Peter and some others to Cornelius in order that Cornelius might be saved. See, being a good man, a God-fearer, and a friend of the Jewish nation does not save you. He needed something better. He needed something more. And God had prepared it. And God, for this, this, this was opening the door to all the world. The gospel was now going to be open to everyone. And Peter goes there and starts preaching the gospel. After explaining what happened to get him to go there, God had to sort of encourage him, uh, twist his arm a bit, perhaps. And uh, then he gets there, and while Peter is still sp speaking, the Holy Spirit, apparently sometimes a bit impatient, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit poured himself out on them, just like at Pentecost, and bam! See, and this was a witness to the apostles because they saw the Holy Spirit doing exactly the same thing that he had done at Pentecost with them on Gentiles who had believed. Cornelius and his whole house believed. And they were born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. And began at that to speak in with other tongues and to praise God. And, and it was, this is... This always occurs in the New Testament. These are uh, sign gifts that demonstrate particularly, especially in this case, also with the Samaritans, and some Jews that hadn't been born again also, that God had received these people. Because the apostles saw the same thing happening with them as God had done with them on Pentecost. And this at Pentecost, there was a radical transformation 
in the church, in the apostles and others. They went from a, a timid uh, group of disciples hiding for fear of the Jews to suddenly this, this bold, spirit-filled, powerful ministry of proclaiming the, the, the gospel in, in power, doing miracles, and also loving one another. The power of the Spirit, God pouring out love in the church. So they loved one another so much that they would sell their possessions to supply uh, necessities for those in need, which were many because those people, those Jewish people in Jerusalem that chose to follow Christ were disowned by their families and by their synagogues and by everybody else. They were outcasts. They had no material means of support. Often, if they weren't property owners themselves, they were without jobs, without support, without family. They'd been cast out as apostates. And that's the situation that was there. And so people like Barnabas that happened to have, well, in this case, an extra field or something they owned, he didn't need it. He sold it and gave the proceeds to the apostles for distribution to the poor in the church because they were in dire circumstances. The love constrained him to do that and everyone else. And then some people, a particular couple, decided to use it for their own glory. And we saw what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah, God had to, uh, to, to demonstrate that he wasn't going to tolerate that. When you're in the very presence of God, just like in the Old Testament when Israel was before uh, the mountain. Sin was not tolerated at all. So even in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, God wanted, needed to demonstrate he was not going to tolerate walking in the flesh. And so that's what Ananias and Sapphira did. They said, oh, this is we, we really like all this attention Barnabas got for, for giving that piece of property he had. We got a piece of property. Hey, how about if we pretend we gave the whole thing, but just sort of, you know, say we got half the amount of money we did. And, and, uh, and since we actually still control the property, you know, that's what they did. The, the sin was not just exaggerating their offering, but lying to God. That was their sin that resulted in their death. They lied. They lied to God. They lied to the church. They lied to the Holy Spirit. They said, yeah, we did that. We gave, we gave all the money. See, they could have done it. There was nothing, there would have been nothing wrong if they simply had said, hey, we've got a piece of property. How about if we give half the proceeds? And just told the apostle, this is half that we sold a piece of property. Here is half the money we got. That would have been accepted. There was nothing, wouldn't have been nothing wrong with that. They weren't required to give everything. No one was required to give everything. Just the requirement of love. The problem was they lied. Pretended to have given everything. Lied about it. God struck them dead because they were that was sinning in the very presence of the Holy Spirit the fullness of the Holy Spirit that was so heavy on the church at that time don't mess with God bad things happen when you when you pull that kind of stunt what you can get away with in the world you can't get away with in the presence of God Does that mean they went to hell? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. God knows the truth. Maybe they weren't ever truly saved. But uh, just as he said about the person that was uh, sleeping with his mother or stepmother or whatever it was in Corinth, he said, uh, Paul said, I've determined to turn him over to the devil for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved. He experienced a punishment and a uh, way to uh, cut off his 
wickedness and to demonstrate the holiness of God to the church. But the man himself, you know, well, God's had it with this kind of activity and he's going to cut you short. Yep. Now you can go explain it to him. Yeah, you can't explain it. All you can do is repent, grovel, and say, God forgive me. I'm a sinful man. And Christ paid for the sins of the world. You just have to trust in that. You just have to trust in that. So we have the promises of the new covenant, which is so much better than the old. So much better. And yet this is almost unknown among Bible believers in the United States. How many sermons have you heard preached on the new covenant? Of all the churches I've visited and all the sermons I've heard, including places where they had visiting preachers coming in, you know, it's like twice a week. Chapel in a particular Bible college, they had uh, speakers come in twice a week. They had chapel twice a week. And never heard a covenant, uh, a sermon on the old, uh, on, on the new covenant. I've heard lots of sermons on David, lots of sermons on Old Testament heroes, but when it comes to the new covenant, what Jesus on the cross, died on the cross to bring in, there's no knowledge of it. They were dispensationalists. They were dispens dispensationalists. There is a, a school of uh, theology out there called New Covenant uh, Theology. I'm not really familiar with it, so I can't recommend it. Um, but there, it does sound like it's probably more biblical because it, it, it focuses on the new covenant, and it's not the same as the old covenant. And, uh, but it, uh, but as far as what they're actually teaching, I don't know. But the only point reason I mention it is because there is a. Uh, it's sometimes because of the certain noise certain parties generate, the predominance of dispensationalism and the noisiness of the Calvinists. We think there's only <coughs> only two things. There's only. There's only a choice between dispensationalism and Reformed Covenant theology, which is a tiny minority of the Christian population of the world. Well, so are dispensationalists. Uh, Lutheranism is different. Um, I'm not quite sure where, what, what shall we call them, Orthodox Lutherans, Bible-believing Lutherans, uh, Gospel-believing Lutherans, which usually isn't a problem among conservative Lutherans, by the way. Uh, I don't know what Luther said about this. Luther said so much stuff that we shouldn't pay too much attention to what he said anyway. But uh, they have a, they are not, they do not hold to Reformed Covenant theology. They don't. And, and they insist, Luther insisted on reading the Bible Christocentrically, including the Old Testament. And he was absolutely right. And that is not the Reformed view at all. They have, uh, in, in general, I should say, because obviously yeah, there's always some people that don't uh, follow the, the crowd. But uh, uh, this is something we need to understand, the New Covenant. And, and I'm, I don't want to recommend New Covenant theology because I don't know what it is. But I didn't get what I know about the New Covenant from them anyway. This is, from what I understand, this is a fairly new movement and it's is coming out of pastors, not out of theologians. And that's one of the critiques of it. Uh, how theolo uh, uh, ideas that arise out of the church and from pastors that are pastoring con uh, congregations. Oh, we don't want to listen to that. We want the theologians to speak, the people that don't actually serve God, that, that sit in the ivory towers. <clears throat> yeah, not impressed. So that would be a plus. But again, the, the, I, I, God himself revealed it to me uh, back in years ago. Let's see, when was that? 1980s, maybe? Uh, and it revolution, revolutionized my faith in, in so many ways. Because now, you know, it's to believe God, to trust in the promises of God. But I didn't know clearly what the promises were. And I was working as an engineer at the time, and I remember I was, I was sitting there, and all of a sudden the thought came into my mind. I wasn't thinking about this. It just popped into my mind. Why did the disciples not ask Jesus 
about the new covenant when he mentioned it. Like, hmm. Hmm. I didn't know where the thought came from. <laughs> it just occurred to me. Like, hmm, that's an interesting question. Why didn't they? And so I remember going home and I searching the scriptures for new covenant. And I found all these references to the Old Testament. And I went back to the Old Testament and looked it up. And all of a sudden, click. They didn't ask him because they already knew what it was. They didn't have to ask him. They were always asking him questions, asking him to explain things. They didn't ask him to explain that because they already knew. They already knew. And when I saw those promises and realizing it's a promise because I had been exposed to independent fundamental Baptists and others, and it was always seemed to be do this, do this, do this, do this sanctify yourself it was always uh it was not that the when i saw the new covenant it was so revolutionary because it was all about what god promised to do in me and i was dissatisfied with my life as a christian i'm still dissatisfied with my life as a christian but i know it's it's it is god who perfects me not me it's not my i'm not my workmanship i'm his and suddenly I had these promises that were fantastic. And all I have to do is ask God, please bring your promises to pass in my life. And I can keep after him until he does it. And he would be pleased with that. If, if we are satisfied with less than what he's promised, we are sinning against him. We're not believing him. We're not trusting him. And so this is what biblical faith is supposed to be. Grab a hold of God. Don't let him go until he's done what he's promised. Don't let him go then either. But that, all these wonderful promises of the new covenant are so much better. And I haven't heard them. And it's so wicked that the church is not preaching the new co covenant constantly. Because they don't know about it. How has the devil so deceived us was such an important thing. Every time there's communion, there's this this cup, cup of wine. Well, it's supposed to be wine. This is a new covenant in my blood. New covenant in my blood. Why doesn't anybody ask? What's the new covenant in my blood? Isn't don't shouldn't that tell us it's something important? Jesus said it. One of the last things he said before he was crucified? Why aren't we asking what the new covenant is? Why aren't preachers preaching it? I think, I think uh, the enemy has deceived us. Has done a sleight of hand to get us focused on things that aren't important. And blinded our eyes to what is, including with different systems of theology, designed to blind our eyes to the promises of God. Because he knows that if we understand what God has promised and we start insisting that God fulfill his promises, which is pleasing to God, Satan's days are finished. And you'll end up seeing the New Testament church in action again. You know, we're out there whining about revival. That's a waste of time. What we need to know, do is know what God has promised and believe his promises. That will revolutionize Christianity today. Change everything. It will change everything.